As we stand, let us pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for this day. A day like no other, you have gathered us together in this church, this cathedral in Nyeri, to worship you, to honor you, as we celebrate the ministry and service and moments of your servant, Bishop Joseph Kagonda. We want to thank you, Lord, for all those who have come to join us in this celebration. Thank you for the President of the Republic of Kenya, his deputy, and all the bishops who are gathered here and each and every one of us. Lord, this is your moment with us. Speak to us your word, the word of life, that we may take it to heart, believe in it, understand it, and live. Use me as you will. Talk to our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please let us be seated. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya, Dr. William Samoy Ruto, Your Excellency, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, Rigadi Gashagwa, all other dignitaries present, my Lord Bishops, our host, and the very reason why we are here, the Right Reverend Joseph Kagonda and his wife, and each and every one of us gathered here, I take this moment to greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Buana Yesu Asifiwe. It is an opportunity God has given us to celebrate him as we worship him this Sunday, taking to mind the ministry and the life of our brother and colleague in ministry, Joseph, who have served this church since 2004, exactly 20 years as a bishop. Bishop, we thank God for you, the clergy of this diocese, the laity, for we know where this diocese was at when you took over. There has been tremendous growth, development, and opportunities that the people of this region has benefited from your ministry and leadership in the church. Your Excellency, we take this opportunity to welcome you to our service and your deputy and all the leaders of our nation. We can say proudly today, the nation of, God, of Kenya is gathered here today. And we are so, so pleased and grateful that you join us uh, to worship with us. The heading of my sharing is beginning and finishing the race. Beginning and finishing the race. I will particularly look at three characters in the Bible, Moses, Solomon, and the Apostle Paul. Not the entire stories, but I will pick a little of their journey in leadership and ministry and service and how they began and finished. Beginning and finishing the race is so critical and so important. Paul likened the Christian service and journey as his to a race in an athletic field. And we all know that uh, races, we have what we specialize as Kenyans, although we thank God we are now getting to the sprints. We have been in the long and middle distance running, and now we are in the sprint. I want to make a comparison of two as we begin, the long races and the short races. The beginning of both is critical. But for the sprint, you must be highly attentive to the commands. For if the trigger goes and you have delayed even a second, you will not make it. The one who was timely will finish before you. But also, if you, if you begin, because it's an anxious moment, with a false start, and do it twice, you'll be disqualified. So, listening the instructions is critical to the beginning of every race, for it is very important to understand the rules and the regulations that govern 
that race. So for the sprint, you must be hearing clearly, you must be waiting for the trigger to go, but you must not slugger for the trigger to go and you are still bending. It must be timed critically. And you shoot as the trigger is shot and you have the opportunity to win the race. For the marathon, it is a different story beginning. They line up nearly a thousand people. They don't kneel down. They just bend or stand and they wait. And the rules are not as strict as in the sprint. They are just told, time, go. And they begin. And they run. So let me go back to the sprint. In the sprint, nearly all sprinters finish because the game is fairly short, precise, and quick. So the level of those who can't finish unless an injury happens or somebody falls down, the chances are everybody finishes. But the defining moment is where you finish. Are you in the front <laughs> or at the last point of it? For the marathon, they begin many, thousands, and they run, and they begin to fall away on the wayside until a leading pack is left. And sometimes the leading pack can go for kilometers together, and they begin to drop one by one. One after the other is dropped along the way until we begin to see the finalist emerge. And uh, what amazes me with our Kenyan marathon runners is the energy they have preserved. And when they release it, you think they are in the sprint. Have you seen them? Yes, they release it as if they, were, they have not been running. Why? They understood the tactics of every bend and every re uh, section on the race and they make sure that those who finish have done their practice well and have uh, exercise, resilience, exercise, uh, energy, preservation, and they know when to release it and when to relax it. Bishop Joseph, you have been in a marathon. Running for 20 years as a bishop is not easy. It has been a marathon. It has had moments of tiredness, of uh, blisters in your legs, moments of pain, but also moments of joy. And that's true to every leadership. And even to you, Your Excellency, it is true to all of us. It is a race we must endure, persist. And uh, I normally like the way they advertise. Uh, a long time ago, this uh, battery is called Energizer. They say, never say die. Never say die. Keep on, keep on. And uh, you have been keeping on and running slowly, steadily, but sure. And today we are celebrating the ministry that you have been running for the last 20 years. You started this diocese with very mega resources, a bunch of clergy. And we have seen growth uh, from one level to another level. Uh, year after year, and we want to thank God for you and your family for the leadership you provided. But also along the way, in the leadership dispensation, you will get angry, people will anger you, things seem not to move, many things come and surround your journey, and it becomes hard and treacherous. Let me draw the first lesson from Moses. Moses, we all know, was called by God when he was standing, guarding, and shepherding his father-in-law's sheep. He was a fugitive who ran away from Egypt, having murdered somebody. He thought it was all done and gone. But God had other plans. You know, our God is a God of second chances, third chances, many chances, so long as we keep faith in him. So God appeared to him in this burning bush and said, Moses, my servant, I have heard the cry of my people, I have seen the affliction, and I have chosen to deliver them from the house of bondage in Egypt, 
and send them to a promised land, a land of plenty, flowing with milk and honey. It is you to go and do the work. He had many excuses. He said, no, I can't. I'm a stammerer. I'm not able. Uh, and he was implored by God and said, I'm going to give you somebody to speak on your behalf. He accepted and he went and delivered the children of Israel. Now, the point I want us to learn from him is in chapter 18, from verse uh, 13, we see him being visited by his father-in-law when he took so long to come and take his family, his wife and children, whom he left behind. And the father-in-law said, I decided to go and look at what this man is doing and hand over his family to him. He's a very irresponsible son-in-law, he might have thought. And he took the children and the wife and he came. He was greeted and wel welcomed. But the following morning he saw Moses governing the people. From morning to evening, people are standing around him while he's seated alone from daybreak to sunset. Sunrise to sunset. And the father-in-law was perturbed. What were you doing with these people? And he said, I'm, I've been made their judge by God. I'm judging small cases and bigger cases and I am listening to their stories and I'm giving them the verdict, what God has said and, and he struggled. And the father-in-law watched at him and said, poor man, you're going to wear yourself out and you're going to die and these people are not going to be served. You must learn to delegate a portion, section of your leadership and have others do what you are not able to do it yourself. Great learning for us leaders. Do we die alone or do we trust others and delegate authority and responsibility to them also to share in the ministry? That's why in the Anglican Church we have the bishop, you have your archdeacons, you have the vicars of the parishes, you have, uh, you know, uh, the lay leaders, you have uh, uh, the, the, the curates, so that this work is shared in equal measure. And I just want to read the ending of that section uh, in chapter 18 of Exodus. Uh, after the advice, verse uh, 22, uh, this man was told, let the people sit, uh, the people you, you choose sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you but decide every matter, uh, decide every minor and cases themselves. So it will be easier for you and they will bear the burden with you. And if you do this and God so command, then you will be able to endure. And all these people will go their homes in peace satisfied. Amen. So when we share responsibility, it makes the Lord easier. And Bishop, we believe you have run for those 20 years because you have shared responsibility. We'll be looking for the next leader. The beauty of the Anglican Church is that we are governed by a constitution that we all ascribe to and follow, but governed by our tradition and led by the Spirit of God. In the day of our consecration, we also announced the day of our exit. And we remember in 2004, Bishop Joseph stood here and said, I will relinquish my office on or before, but not later than midnight of the 15th of April, 2024. That was said 20 years ago. To, tomorrow night is that hour. So he will relinquish his office tomorrow night. Today we are celebrating his ministry. However, the Anglican Church does not leave a vacuum. When there is no bishop, the bishop takes over. So people of uh, Mount Kenya West, I'm now your bishop. We will begin the process until we get the bishop and consecrate then I leave the diocese to that person. Let me give you a glimpse of our process. As soon as he retire, I will come here and announce the diocese is vacant. 
we open nominations for one month. All those clergy who want to become bishops, you will be free to be nominated. A nomination will be, you must get five people nominating you. Three clergy, two laity, and you, yourself, sign you accept nomination. We shall close those nominations, and the days are already there, by noon of that particular day. If you bring it five minutes late, you are disqualified. So, guard yourselves. Then, after one month is over, I have already put up a, a search committee. The search will sit here, comprised of 12 people, six from this diocese, and six from all over Kenya, two bishops, two priests, and two laity. They will interview thoroughly those who want to become bishops. Listen to their story, their focus, their vision a whole day. And even if it needs to take two days, we don't care. So long as they are well interviewed. They clear only up to three. three. So the following month, so I hope you are counting the month I'm going to be your bishop. <laughs> the third month, there will be an electoral college which will sit to uh, do the election of the three. And it is a delegation of 23 people. 16 from this diocese and uh, 7 from all over Kenya. Three bishops, two clergy and two laity from many other areas. But we are not going to give you anybody from central Kenya. They'll come from Mombasa, they'll come from Nyanza, they'll come from western, they'll come from, but not central Kenya. So that we have a, because all the six, 16 from here are from this region. So you'll have a fair hearing of our people from all over the, the country participating in the election of a bishop in the Anglican Church. They will cast their vote and we get our bishop. But uh, here, we'll have to wait a little bit of that process because the first thing we shall have to come and fix is to hold your synod, which was halted, so that we get the standing committee of synod, which translates into an electoral college. Are we together? So I want to urge all those who have run to court, the church matters are not dealt in the court, they are dealt within here. Uh, get those cases out. I'll be coming to chair the synod, and the synod will give us the standing committee, which will give us an electoral college, and we shall have the election of the next bishop. So if you delay that process, you'll delay getting your bishop, and I will enjoy being your bishop, so don't worry. Now, back to Moses. How did Moses finish? Because he missed one command. You remember he missed one command. He was told pray to the rock to get water to the children of Israel because he was being disturbed. And I know you are excellency, how the people of Kenya disturb you sometimes. And they also disturb the bishop and they disturb me. When, when he was worked up, you know, Moses was also worked up. And then he hit the rock instead of uh, praying. What happened? He missed the promised land. Did you know that? He missed the promised land. So let us keep the rules to the latter so that we don't miss out. We don't want you, Bishop, after working so hard to leave this church in bitterness, you may miss the promised land. Release it. Forgive. And they also forgive you and release. So all the bruises should go away. And we begin a new slate because you have a life after this. This church will still need you, will still use you, and we thank God for you. So let us not finish like Moses who missed out the promised land. He was also only shown by at far, but he did not enter it. The goodness is that the Lord went with him. So I think he, he didn't miss heaven. He didn't miss heaven. He only missed the promised land, but he went to heaven. So let, let's make sure that we don't miss it. We don't miss it. We don't miss what God has promised us. Now Solomon. Solomon in First Kings chapter 3. And uh, beginning from verse uh, 10. This gentleman, actually beginning from verse 5. This gentleman took over from his father David. He was so naive and young. 
Then he went to the Lord and said to the Lord, Now, you know I am a child. My father ruled, and I saw it, but it is so difficult. And I know it is very hard for me to govern all these people. But I just need one thing from you, my Lord. Give me wisdom and understanding. Let me just read those verses. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people. Ability to discern between uh, good and evil. For who can govern these your people who are so many? I need wisdom. I need a spirit of discernment. I need clear understanding and ability to govern them. And Lord listened his prayer carefully. But see what is given to, me, to, to Solomon by God. And this is what God said. But have, you know, uh, beginning from verse 10, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for life of your enemies to be ended, but have asked for your understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I will give you wisdom, a discerning mind. No one like you shall ever live who has such a discerning mind. I will give you also what you have not asked. Listen to what God says. What you have not asked. If you ask the right things. Both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall come with, uh, shall uh, compare with you. If you walk in my ways. Amen. If you do what? If you walk in my ways. Solomon as young and naive as he was, took over leadership. He was so afraid how to govern and lead the people of God. But he said, I'm not going to go it alone. I'm not going to trust in the counsel of any other person, but I go to the one who has all wisdom and understanding. He went to his God and said, Lord, give me understanding. A spirit of discernment, so that I may know how to judge what is right from what is wrong. I may know how to judge what is right and what is wrong. I delve a little bit in trying to search what this understanding is all about. And the spirit of discernment, what is it all about? And this is what I found out. Understanding means good knowledge of something. Awareness of other people's feelings and capabilities. Being tolerant and forgiving even when it is so hard and painful. It also refers as one who is kind, uh, one who is said to be a kind and understanding person is one who has insight of good judgment of things. Discernment is the ability to make a smart judgment about anything you are imagining or processing. Judging things clearly. Ability to perceive and understand things, especially those that are not uh, obvious and those which are not straightforward. That is a challenge we have every day as leaders. Even the things that are not obvious, people still expect you to know and understand Things that are not straightforward, you are still expected to have the ability to perceive and dig deeper and process and get the right judgment and view of things. This is what we all need. As leaders in the church, my bishops, as the president of the Republic of Kenya, as the deputy and all other leaders, as head of businesses, heads of corporations, we need the spirit of God of discernment and clear understanding of how things look like. So, Bishop, you are now transiting to a new phase of life. Our prayer is God will still give you the discerning spirit to understand the new terrain 
as a retired bishop. Some of us sometimes, because we don't prepare well to, ex to exit, want to hang on beyond the limited time or want to say, I'm not ready, I need extension or, or, or I need more time. We all need to know when entering, there will be exit. Let us plan for our exit well and prepare the next phase of leadership. If we do that, God will reward us. And now, in Paul's letter, he talks of finishing well. But he begins by saying, the crown of righteousness is ahead of me. I press on, I press on to attain it. Not that I have already been there or have finished but I, I keep on pressing on. I keep on struggling, forgetting what is behind me, but getting focused to the main thing because God has given me an opportunity to celebrate. What is normally called a legacy is an assessment of our achievements when we are there. It doesn't, it's not obvious when we begin, but it becomes evident along the way depending on how we dispense our leadership. We need to be careful, like the marathon runner, to understand every bend and every corner and make sure that there is a legacy we are leaving. For those who are running for breaking the world record, they need pacemakers. They need people to set the, the speed of the race in the beginning so that he doesn't uh, miscalculate his timings. But he persists on and on until the end. And Paul says, at the end is the reward. So, Bishop, as you retire, there is immense reward, not just from people and your congregants and your fellow uh, workmates, but the greatest reward is from the Lord himself. That is what we need to be careful about as leaders, both national and church. For God will hold us accountable for every action, every undertaking, and uh, will not accept, uh, escape in the last moment. As I conclude... The purpose of calling leadership is to better the people they lead and leave a lasting impact in the life of others. Our prayer is the impact you have left, Bishop Joseph, will live on even after your retirement. That is a prayer for each one of us. That is a prayer for our national leaders that the impact of our leadership will live long after we have exited the scene. In the name of God the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Let's appreciate the word. Thank you so much, Your Grace.